But what if I would not have told you that you had something in your hair right then? Uh, we would toss the entire <laughs> video podcast thing. It would be a no-go. Okay, you would have yeah. just but said audio hair, only? Yeah. I don't have a the problem air. with this stuff in my hair. No. Right? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Now, okay. So, story. do you? If you have you ever had a client sitting in front of you and they've got something on their face? Yeah. What? What have you? What have you seen? I've seen boogers. Yeah. I've seen food. Yeah. Okay. What do you do? Te- stuff in the teeth. Stuff in the teeth. What do you People do? People eat sometimes in session when they're rushing in. <gasps> okay. Can we talk about that? <laughs> How often do you see that? My my wife when I'll tell her. She's blown away. She's like, I would never eat food in the session, but what? It's not common, but honestly, the times that I do see it are the clients that I'm working with to slow down and mm-hmm. take care of themselves. So I actually see it as a positive thing when they're yeah, doing it. So I'm they fine. come in and they're eating, and uh, but it's always hard for them to talk and try to eat at the same time. So yes. that becomes a exactly back okay. And forth. Um, what? And I totally agree. So you know, uh, clients who are who come to me and with food, no problem, right? I want that to be the, the right. bottom line. But, like, anything crazy that you've had eaten in your presence? No, not that's popping off the top of okay. my, my mind. Uh, normally it's fast food, and I had a client for a long time that would always bring in and out, mm-hmm. and so, and that was fine, right? And then, and I always did kind Do you ever of, want some? Yes, and I was going to say... Just like, I, just one fry? <laughs> just like... Honestly, and so, yeah. and I, I, this person, I'm not even see. I'm protecting, I'm being very ethical, I'm not even saying a gender or anything, because I love this person, loved working with this person, but I would say, it, I, in my mind, I'm like, at times, I mean, they're going to offer me at least one, right? <laughs> You're thinking. Yeah, it never happened, but the, uh, the story that comes to my mind, the oddest one is uh, that someone brought literally a plate of spaghetti. Yeah. So that one was a little, like, they had to come out of their car with a plate. That's hilarious. Bring it in. And coming in. Well, they feel at ease. And, That's uh, the way I took you it. You know, they're, they're, it sounds like they're living here. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay, my guest is Shelly Aldrich. Shelly, welcome to the virtual couch, although we were on chairs. I've kind of mi- mixed yeah. things up a little bit. Um, they're big chairs, though. They're big chairs. Like uh, but I've been trying, it's taken me 31 episodes to get you on the show. That's really not true, I right? It, I mean, it has kind of, but it's, it's taken just because, a long time. Yeah, but that's yeah. just because we both are busy and schedules. And our and, offices are literally right across the hallway from each yep, other. Yep, yep. I can open my door and I can see your office, yep. right? But I'm I was, so. I was thinking this morning at how we work together and have for years and years worked mm-hmm. together. But it's 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 hard to uh, find time to uh, just have time together. We're so busy. Yeah, so yeah. I'm actually glad I get to hang out. No, me too. And so, and I always, in my mind, I feel like at times this is like a radio show and everybody's hanging on to hear what we're going to talk about, but they've already seen in the episode description okay. that we're talking today about anxiety, anxiety. right? Yeah. Uh, and Shelly um, Shelley has a, a wide range of therapeutic skills. And so um, she could talk about a variety of subjects, but uh, we kind of felt like this is a good one to yeah. um, get your feet wet in the podcast world, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I want to ask you about your background, but I just want to say, so Shelly was my uh, supervisor. So when you get your, to become a therapist, right, you get a master's in counseling. And then you have to have how many hours, Shelly, of supervised? 3,000. 3,000 hours supervised. And so Shelly was... Which doesn't necessarily sound like a lot, but it's in certain categories and not all those working hours count. And it is just yeah. a monster. But it's so important because as a shiny new therapist, and, and I've talked about this on my podcast at times, I mean, boy, when you started as a therapist, how much different are you now? Oh, so I've been practicing for 15 years. 15 years. I thought years. about that the other day. That makes me feel really old. Okay. But when I think of all the chapters of experience I've had from that and and how, you know, I think forward in uh-huh. 20 years, what how will I be like then? Yeah. You know? So when you're brand new, I mean, you really do need a supervisor. And so you were there, you know, you, you come up, run into client situations that you really aren't sure about and you bring those to your supervisor and you're trusting your supervisor to help you make sense of those and you were amazing at that so yeah that was a lot of fun thank you um all right give us a little bit about your background before we get into the topic of anxiety okay so uh let's see like i said i've been practicing for about 15 years now do we throw the joke in there like oh she started when she was 12 yeah right? i was 12 years old okay you can tell me how young i look so get that in there. <laughs> yeah. i will okay but, uh, look very young yeah <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, and I, I have worked with a pretty wide range of issues. Um, uh, I work a lot with individuals, uh, couples, families. Um, I have specialized in working with children, mm. which has been awesome. Um, I did a lot of residential work with kids for a long time, working with some of the most severe issues like you know, trauma and abuse and severe neglect issues. And uh, so um, that was uh, an important sort of launch to my career, and I was grateful that I got that experience. Um, did you did you have like a certain calling? Like you knew I wanted to be a therapist and work with a certain type of population? 
I did. I wanted to uh, do couples, which okay. I got very clear about that in grad school okay. um, and was super excited to do that. And so early in my career, it did go in the direction of kids and families. And, uh, and I really felt like I was okay with that shift at that time because it was, it, it just felt right. Okay. Um, and it has, you know, so much of my early experience just helped me so much be prepared for private practice because we see some really common things, but we also see a wide range of things in private practice. Yeah. You kind of never know what kind of issues are going to be coming in. And so I feel like it gave me a really good base and, and yeah. I just love private practice. Okay. I and and I have it. to tell you, I feel, I'm not just saying because you're here, but the, it takes a special person to work with kids. Um, and, I, and I've mentioned this on here before, I, I did my practicum, which is when you, you're first starting out basically being a uh, therapist uh, rookie, right? Mm -hmm. My practicum was with, uh, with kids, and, and I, I honestly felt bad that I didn't want to work with kids moving forward, but it was because I felt like I didn't, that wasn't my, my kind of skill set, and I just wanted to wring the neck of the parents, right? So then I really knew I wanted to do more of the couples. Yeah. So when did you know that, okay, this is, this is something I love, the kids part? Um, I think that goes back to always having wanted to be a mom. So that's a big part of who I am, and I can talk about that in a second. But um, I, I knew early on, uh, you know, I, because I was exposed, first of all, to work with kids, uh, these are the children we hear about on the news. Mm. And then you just don't ever hear their follow-up stories. Okay. So um, they could not function in foster care. So they were in residential treatment um, oh. because their behavioral issues as a result of the trauma and neglects that they had been through, uh, you know, they, they failed in those kind of settings. So here they are in residential. But I had the chance to do long-term intensive therapy with them uh, and I had some amazing supervisors uh, who I'm still friends with today who helped me grow and change. I didn't realize you did, so you group homes and things yeah. like that? I didn't yeah. know that. I didn't yeah. know that about you. Yeah. Okay. Did that for a long time um, and uh, and it, it just, you know, it changed me as a person. In fact, uh, when I uh, was first hired uh, for a, uh, a group home in uh, Davis, uh, it was a uh, Families first at the time. Um, a uh, that we were waiting for my fingerprinting mm -hmm. clearance to come through, so I wasn't allowed to work with the kids yet. But mm -hmm. I was hired, and they wanted me there. So uh, they literally put me in a closet. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, and it's where all the records were. Uh -huh. And for three weeks, I sat and had to read oh. file folders of what these kids had been through. Wow! And as a person. It changed me. Okay. It changed me. And uh, look at it different from that point. And it it just did. I mean, it it changed me from the inside out. And then I had supervisors who were able to mold me into how to do the work with children. Wow. And I think it's true for any issues that we learn and develop. There's part of you as a therapist that has to grow yourself, not only in your profession and in your skill set, but it changes you as a person. Mm. It evolves you. Yeah. Uh, you know, your heart has to grow. Your your uh, own limitations you have to find ways to get past that and so I think my work with kids uh, helped me grow so much personally early in my career and I think it just made me a better parent too. I just had a little epiphany um, you know you you know Sean Davis and mm -hmm. he was on with an episode and we kind of talked about uh, how when you start down the program of being a therapist you hear that this will change you and a lot of times I think we think, oh no, you know it won't, I mean, but then it really does. Yeah. And then we're in this business of change and how often do we have people coming to us and they're saying, I don't even know if I can change or yeah. I don't know if change is really possible. Yeah. And I love what you just said of, oh no, you you changed, right? So you, you're you living it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have choices about change. We yeah. feel it, we feel that resistance and that uh, pressure and the challenge coming towards you. And, and then you have choices about, you know, how to figure out things to, to push through that. We have to evolve and grow, and those are the powerful moments where yeah. we can do something different than what we knew how to do before. Now, is that a perfect that. segue to work into anxiety, or? Sure, can I, I want to talk about my kids for perfect. a second. Perfect, Because they're such a big part of me. Okay. So, and I have my, my little jewelry on today. So I have a good friend, a little shout out to her, uh, Nikki Harmon in Utah, who uh, did I some chills. I was reaching out to her this morning. Okay. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. So she's a, she's a great therapist and a great friend. She uh, had, makes personalized jewelry, um, and she was doing it for fundraising to adopt a child. So she's adopting a child overseas, and they're mm. in the process of that. It's pretty cool I may stuff. be trying to get a hold of her to see if she would want to come on the podcast. Oh, yeah. that would be great. Right? She's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, I have ordered some of my personalized jewelry, and I'm just 
saying this for a couple of reasons. One is it's just kind of fun. Uh-huh. So as a therapist, the jewelry now has become my little way of kind of uh, expressing myself. Uh-huh. Um, and so I've got uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law gave me a bracelet here and uh, for Christmas that says everything happens for a reason. Okay. So there's these little things. And I've got my charms and my kids here. When I travel especially, I make sure I'm wearing my necklace. It's okay. got my kids close to my heart. So nice. I'm a single parent, so shout out to single parents. Uh, dads and moms out there, shout out to parents, period. Um, but yeah, I have two girls that um, raise in on my own and, and loving every minute of uh, being their mom. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and I just had a experience with your older daughter where she works and she's just awesome. Like oh, she really thank is. You. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, okay. Where do we go now? Okay. So anxiety. Yeah. So uh, anxiety is uh, a topic I felt comfortable talking about uh, in this first uh, hangout session here with you um, for multiple reasons. One is uh, in the last, I would say, five, maybe plus years. Um, my practice has just been inundated with this issue. Mm. Um, and then we can talk more about the, that it is just is so prevalent. Um, it also has, uh, as I've done the work and grown myself, um, I've become more aware of the uh, anxiety that I deal with okay. personally. And, uh, and, and was, had some awareness of that because we all experience anxiety. It's a normal emotion. We all experience stress. Um, so I've just become more attuned and more aware to my own level of anxiety that I kind of struggle with. Um, and um, I have a child who has significant anxiety and has quite a battle, significant battle with that. And she's given me permission to talk a little bit about that today. Which is wonderful. Yeah. So it hits, you know, it, it's something I feel like I can relate to and talk uh, about on many different levels. Okay. Do you, are you okay if uh, kind of what's your definition of anxiety? Yeah. Or- because yeah. I like how you say everybody feels it, and I know they do, but I think that some people don't know how to label it, or they think that yeah. something's wrong with them. Or yeah. So what is anxiety, if you're describing it as somebody? So let's start with uh, trying to categorize it a little bit. So uh, hopefully anyone listening to this podcast today can relate to it, at least on the level of it's a basic human emotion that okay. we all experience. So sometimes we call it stress, sometimes we call it nervousness. Uh, it can even border on fear a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we all feel that it's a normal part of life. Um, it's a signal to us that we should pay attention to something, right? I like that. Um, yeah. So, so we can all relate to that. So anxiety is an important signal. It's an important emotion that helps us pay attention to our environment and potentially things that might be dangerous. Uh, and yeah, it has like a a biological. Um, it's necessary, right? It is. Because if you go back into, I remember doing a training, and, and this guy was big into evolutionary biology, and he said that you know this is the part that kept us uh, not being killed from saber toothed tigers, right. right? Right. Now we don't necessarily have the saber toothed tigers. Get up and run. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's good. Um, uh, something again that I think all listeners probably can relate to is that uh, research really is showing that it's so prevalent. Mm. So all of us are experiencing, generally speaking, all of us are experiencing higher levels of anxiety. And we're really seeing some societal shifts and reasons for some of that. Uh, we're seeing some technology impact on some of that. Um, anxiety disorders are the number one most prevalent mental health issue that oh. there is. Okay. So, so we all need to know about it. We all need to recognize its role in our life. And we can, hopefully, as we categorize some things today, people can uh, sort of assess themselves in a really healthy uh, way as to where their anxiety is and how they respond to those signals of anxiety and and uh, how it's kind of impacting their life. Okay. So if we go kind of to uh, a little bit more the fur- further end of the, the spectrum there um, of where we start talking about mental health disorders, like at what point does it become a problem where you either need to seek some professional help or you really need to recognize that uh, anxiety is taking over and becoming problematic in your life as opposed to helping signal things you should pay attention okay. to. Um, and so one of the ways that we really start to assess that is when it starts to impair our functioning. Okay. So and this requires some uh, awareness, right? Yeah. Because I think, do you find that a lot of people will, they don't even realize they're slowly pulling away from friends or isolating yeah. or, and so then that they feel like there's good reason or justification. Yeah. Or, 
Okay. Or a lot of times they're paying attention to external reasons for that. Okay. And not, oh, I'm not going to that party because so and so is going to be yeah. there, as opposed to really recognizing that you know in lots of areas of their life they're re recognizing or they're experiencing anxiety and avoiding yeah. situations. So so I think sometimes people that awareness is important. They're quicker to blame it on things on the outside, not just because they don't have that insight yet or that right. connection that something bigger is going on. Shout out to therapists because, I mean, this is the part where I feel like it helps to go work these things through because my mind just went to, um, we're also working with clients at times to set healthy boundaries, mm -hmm. but then at what point is a healthy boundary being a, I don't want to say an excuse, right? But it's yeah. like a, a way to then say, I don't really need to deal with this thing, Yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So anxiety starts hijacking your life yeah. slowly okay. into different degrees. And, uh, you know, sometimes for some people that can just be you're going through a hard time and that just kind of creeps up and gets you for a little while and then it kind of works itself out and you're kind of right back in the sort of, you know, back on the highway of life uh, as usual. Um, but for some people, it starts to really progress and become worse and worse. And it just slowly can creep in there, and sometimes it can come on really fast. Can you think of a, so an example of, I'm almost thinking of situational things, that you know something's coming, you get really anxious, the thing happens, and then it's gone. And, I mean, is that an example of just... Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that might be, you know, we know that public speaking is one of the most anxiety-provoking situations yeah. there is. That's one of people's biggest fears. Um, and so, yeah, you have an upcoming speech to give at school, and you get nervous about it for days in advance. You give the speech, you get through it, and the anxiety is gone after that, right? Okay. That would be some pretty normal situational anxiety. Uh, and, and some people might need a little bit of extra help for how to cope with that anxiety in days before, and there's certainly things you can do to work through normal anxiety anxieties that come up um, but I think today we're gonna focus a little bit more on when it really starts to stop you in your tracks. Okay perfect. You okay. Know? So um, let's back up a little bit and let's talk about what those symptoms really look like and uh, this is where today I really want to be an advocate for those who really suffer okay. with anxiety because I think because it is so common and we all experience it to some degree it also gets minimized mm. like how um, painful it actually really is. Okay. And so, um, uh, anxiety starts with a cognition. It starts with a worry. Okay. And that doesn't mean that somebody creates that or makes it happen for whatever reason. Let's just, we could argue about that all day. Right. But, um, you know, the cognition's there, which really starts as a worry. Okay. A worry's different than just a, a neutral, benign thought. Okay. And when right? you say cognition, by the way, for just the average, so yeah. you're talking about thought. It yes. starts with a thought. Okay. It starts with a thought. Okay. Uh, so with anxiety, it's an intrusive thought. Okay. Now we can put that on a scale. I like to use my zero to 10 scale just to keep it simple. So, uh, but for anxious thoughts, right, they're gonna be, they're gonna have some higher numbers there. Okay. So it starts with uh, an anxious thought, but what really starts to happen with anxiety is it then sets off those alarms mm. that we were talking about. So it sets off all these physiological signs in the body and responses. So it's really the stress response. It kicks us into fight or flight. Okay, so literally, and this is where I love the physiological, your heart rate increases. What Absolutely. else happens? Every it's real, Absolutely. right? The heart rate launches like everything yeah. into, uh, uh, and so yeah, you're gonna have the rapid heart rate, uh, which immediately kind of makes you start to feel like you can't breathe, mm -hmm. even though you are. It kind of makes you feel like you're losing your breath. Uh, some people uh, even can can feel uh, like they can't catch their breaths. Um, uh, lots of uh, GI. Uh, things start to take place including like acids released in the stomach and you can that's where a lot of stomach pains come from okay. um, a lot of children will complain of stomach aches and parents get frustrated because yeah. they think they're making up symptoms because they don't want to go to school or they they can see the avoidance sure but there really is the physiological component I don't know that. if I've ever tied those that is that's kind of interesting right yeah um, a lot of my clients struggle uh, with immediately they can get extreme uh, GI symptoms including diarrhea and constant patient and um, so we need to be able to talk about all the things that happen in the body so that people really can make those connections mm -hmm. as to how their anxiety is affecting their body but again so that other people who are uh, uh, have family members or friends or people they love and care about struggling with anxiety can really be sympathetic to how it really is it just sets off the stress response in the body okay including lots of neurochemicals being released cortisol being released all of those things that are you know uh, from an evolutionary perspective there to help us 
say it and protect ourselves. Okay. Uh, but the alarm is getting tripped more and more with people on a regular, more chronic, pervasive basis yeah. every day. So okay. we can see how that's causing problems. Um, all of the, the medical impact of all of those things chronically happening in our body, including the level of hypervigilance um, of our nervous system, you can just uh, play that out, uh, including inflammation in the body and it taxing all the organs. Wow. And it, it, it's the same as chronic sort of stress. Okay. Um, and we know you can go to, uh, I've been to actually even lots of our, um, the professional conferences that we go to crosses over a lot with the medical field. And so I'm constantly hearing about the toll that our chronic anxiety and stress just takes on the body. And yeah. how it's the long-term impact of that is pretty devastating. Okay, and then do you, I, I'm dying to jump into, you know, do you want to hit solutions yet or do you want to kind of lay out more of the picture? I mean, because there's, when you talk about that, I immediately think of people that I work with who, when they start to feel like they can't breathe, and I love how you laid that out, they've had some intrusive thought, and yeah. and now the physiological symptoms kick in and people just want to say, hey, calm down, right? Yeah. Which is the Absolutely. last thing that the person wants to hear. Yeah. Do you want to kind of go there now? Yeah, let's okay. talk about that. Good awareness. And and we'll talk more about that too when we talk about treatment. Okay. Is, is family members and yeah. loved ones, what to do, what not to do, and how you can really under uh, be supportive. Um, but I think most importantly, that comes with an education. That's okay. why we're spending some time on really understanding the symptoms. Yeah. Because uh, I know as I describe those symptoms, it, it kind of makes all of us get triggered with a little bit of stress. Right, totally, right? yes. It's like, ooh, yeah, my heart rate's going up a little bit there as you describe that which as a side note by the way is one of the reasons people avoid treatment oh talking about your anxiety makes you more anxious sure. it's like going into the eye of the storm there yeah it's the last place they want to go and, and sometimes they just feel like they can't do it yeah um, so we really need to be uh, sensitive to the physical distress that anxiety really brings so that is the cliche that's gonna probably get a little hard before it yeah. gets better yeah, right absolutely okay but then you get the skills for how to manage it. So okay. I love the word metabolizing. So you metabolize the anxiety, and that's what you learn how to do in therapy. Okay. How to work through it, how to reduce it, how to manage it in your life. Um, and, and when I see people really make progress with that, the anxiety uh, becomes less Re uh, relentless in their life that you we really see it reduce in a lot of different areas it's, it's almost like anxiety is this this entity yeah that once it can't get to you as much anymore it really starts to back off in wow. lots of different areas and then people when they get to that level and they're getting that level of relief then it really starts really, to change like their yeah life, they're feeling right? empowered and they're yes. feeling like okay i love the way you laid that out so so what do you, or we can wait, we can wait. I'm dying to get to the, uh, what do you say you instead of calm down, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, okay, oh. so thanks for bringing me back because um, I could go in lots of different directions today. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, and, and you know, I, I like to describe, uh, you know, uh, levels okay. and stages of treatment and stages of recovery okay. from anxiety. So what families uh, and loved ones should do varies at different stages. Oh, all right, fair So point. early on, yeah. it's important for people just to be compassionate and understanding. Okay, empathy. Yeah, okay. empathy, empathy, empathy. Uh, let the person tell you what their experience is like. Encourage them to say more because what a lot of times, yeah. I already was <laughs> first of all, yeah. other people's anxiety triggers our own anxiety. Sure. So we can want to shut that down, not because we don't care, but it's just kind of overwhelming. Uh, often we feel helpless and we're not sure how to help. Um, and we just, we see people struggle and not getting better and we get frustrated with that. Right. Sometimes. And then we make it, it becomes about us too. Yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Right. And then that, that doesn't make the person feel like. It doesn't. And we can oscillate yeah. between being helpful and loving and being empathic in those moments. And then we can also, you know, we can get hit our frustrations and be angry or blame the person yes. or not be very understanding. Yeah. And then that just adds to the avoidance yeah, for people really with anxiety of like, you know what? No one gets this. I can't trust anyone right now. And I've, I've had people literally say, look, oh, I, I do the empathy thing. I was I, for 10 minutes. I told them I'm so sorry, but, but then I lost it. Right. Yeah. And like, yeah, it might take a little longer than 10 minutes. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it helps family members, too, to understand stages. So when I'm working with kids, which, again, has really become epidemic in my practice, uh -huh. um, and, uh, and, and it has become just this sort of specialty now that I do is working with children and families uh, with anxiety, um, one in every eight kids 
now is struggling with significant anxiety. Significant. Wow. Significant. Okay. I mean, that's like insane, yeah, right? Yeah, that's, that's like really Yeah, look around a classroom and there's like a, Absolutely. several kids that are really struggling in that moment then probably. Yeah. yeah. And, and I am noticing, this is anecdotal, I don't have any evidence for this, but I'm noticing these tend to be really compliant kids. Yeah. The kids who are trying to be perfect, they're trying to do a good job. Um, and, uh, and, and so they're not saying anything about the suffering that they're having. They're mm -hmm. trying to just be good, they're trying to do their work, and they are just sitting there suffering in silence. Wow. And I wanna bring a voice to that too. That's, I have a couple of those right, you know, yeah. I don't do a lot with uh, the younger clients yeah. I work with. I mean, because uh, they don't, and they're worried they would get in trouble if they say anything, Absolutely. right? And a lot of what they're doing is to avoid that. Yeah. Um, they don't even wanna raise their hand and give a wrong answer. Yep. Uh, they don't wanna, uh, uh, asked to go to the bathroom yeah think about the GI problems that they're having wow. and they are in class and they're afraid to go to the bathroom okay and they, and, and and they don't want anyone to know about their anxiety absolutely and then I, boy, I'm thinking through a couple of right now where and the, yeah they don't want their friends to know anything about it and then meanwhile they're just struggling inside they don't want to go to their teacher if you can get them to I don't yeah. know if I've ever had a situation where it hasn't been a good thing where a teacher's been like you're good you know but they, yeah. they sit with that for weeks, months, yep. who knows? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's very, they're very vulnerable and sensitive and wounded because yeah. uh, they're in fight or flight. So actually it comes down to trust. Uh -huh. Whatever responses you're having to them in those moments are, are translating to, can I trust you or can I not? So yeah. you can see how people are just blowing that right and left with kids yeah. when that's not really what they're meaning to do. But yeah. that's, that's the level the kids are operating at. But I wanted to come back to families. Yeah. And so early on I tell families, uh, I tell parents, I say, look, I know this is frustrating. I know your child's struggling with certain things that you want them to be able to do. But if you can't create a really trusting, safe, calm environment for them, uh, then we're not going to be able to get to the later stages, mm -hmm. which is where you're going to set boundaries and you're going to be in there helping coach them to use these skills right. in the moment to get through things. But you got to create this climate of trust and loyalty and staying calm with them under all conditions before we can get to that other spot. Because a lot of parents feel like they're enabling. Okay. And, and we are. We're going to enable for a little while a little until bit. we build their trust okay, and we build their skill set and we build yours. Yeah. parents okay. and, and loved ones uh, we've got to build your skill set too and how to support and help and, and coach them through things so if I give this kind of go back to this example so if somebody is looking for some tangible thing to wrap their head around you've got a, a teenager or a young adult that is you know they are they have anxiety they're struggling to breathe they don't want to go to school that sort of thing yeah. parent comes in I want to help here's some empathy but come on you know what do you do in the, so I love what you're saying about it's, we're kind of playing the long game. We're going to have to double down on empathy yep. before they'll trust us. Absolutely. So, you know, what do you tell someone in that situation then? Uh, like, what do they say yeah. in, in yeah, that moment yeah. when a teenager doesn't yeah, want to go to school? Yeah. Well, I think um, part of the conversation becomes maybe not right in that moment. Yeah. It's the night before. Hey, buddy. I know you're having a really hard time getting to school right now. Is this kid's name buddy or is this like universal? <laughs> this is universal buddy. Okay, yes. all right. Thanks for clarifying You that. bet. Okay. So. <laughs> um, so, hey buddy, um, you know, I, I'm concerned. Um, I, I can see you're really struggling with being able to get to school right now and I can see you really suffering with that. I can see that, that you uh, aren't necessarily, I know you're choosing not to go to school, but, but you're wrestling with stuff that's, that's out of your control right now and that you just don't know what to do with and I'm concerned and I care about that and I wanna help you with that. I think we need to talk about some ways to get some help with that. Okay, so when the waters are calm, you kind of, yeah. yeah. absolutely, and proactive times. Proactive. When, when they're in fight or flight, we're not getting the frontal lobe functioning, the executive functioning of their brain. We don't have access to that, and they don't either. Yeah, so I almost want you to like anywhere. that is that is the uh, I will pick my mic up and drop it moment of this podcast. Yeah. Because I feel like that is that is when we are trying to make sense of it. We really are. Um, it, which is so I love well, how you're saying that. It, yeah, but we, moments, and we right? can't. Yeah, I love that. That yeah. we can't. And the only way that we can, and this is why it's stages, um, and even at the later stages, if someone's activated yeah. in intense levels of anxiety, we always go back to square one. Yeah. Nothing but creating safety and help pull them out of fight or flight is okay. gonna work. How do you do that? Uh, Hug it out? I, I mean, I'm kind of being lighthearted, uh, uh, but I mean, no, the physical no, uh, touch can be a, a good thing, times, right? A lot of times, hugging it out is too much. Okay. It's too oh, intense. That's good to know. You're coming too close. And so imagine trying, uh, when we're in pain uh -huh. and someone comes close and hugs us, 
it, it, it doesn't necessarily feel good, right? Yeah. It's taking everything inside of us to manage that pain in the moment to get through it, if it's an intense pain. Yeah. Um, uh, and so imagine it that way. Mm. When someone's in intense anxiety, they do need our support. They need us to come in and help them with things that they may not be able to do for themselves in those moments. But we really have to take their lead on that. Yeah. Um, and we've got to help them calm down. And as the anxiety gets smaller, then you might be able to come in. That's awesome. You might be able to do a hug. And, and, and some touch is great. In fact, you can probably do some touch earlier, depending on the person in your relationship and their boundaries. Um, but a touch is one of the most important things to get the parasympathetic nervous system to kick oh, in. Oh, she pulled out the big words. Yeah, and I hope I got that right. Somebody better Sounds not good. Google that. And see no, if so wrong. you're even just like a hand but on the shoulder or whatever. Exactly. Oh, like a that. hand on the shoulder. Okay. Uh, it does wonders. But I don't want people to run out and do that. Yet. Okay. <laughs> because it also can send the person literally running away from yeah. you. It can be too much. It's a okay. long time. Stages. I'm like so you this. build you build up to that. And 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 the be one of the best things is really get communication going, right? So if you're just checking in with the person and you're asking more about the anxiety instead of running away from that, mm -hmm. um, the person wants to run away from it too. They don't want to talk about it. But if you can say things like, "So, so tell me what you're feeling," and if you turn to the body, tell me what you're feeling right now. Is your heart rate beating wow. fast? Is it hard to kind of breathe? Um, I love scales. Tell me, tell me how big your anxiety is right now. Is there anything specifically that you're worried or afraid of right now? Sometimes there's a trigger that's identifiable and sometimes there's not. Any come to mind? Like what you, I mean, because I'm thinking back to the, sometimes it could be school, tests, friends, yep. things like that. Yeah, and those are some pretty pretty normal things that we okay. can get anxiety about. Um, uh, I, uh, my daughter really struggles with, uh, it used to be storms. Okay. Um, in fact, yesterday there was a tornado warning that just went off on the radio when I was driving to run some errands, uh -huh. and my heart skipped a beat for a second because I'm like, man, if this if this alarm goes off on a cell phone in a teacher's classroom and my daughter's in there, and she hears that there's a tornado warning oh. here in uh, uh, you know uh, Placer County, then uh, I'm gonna get a phone call. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. have a kid to go pick up. Yeah. Um. So so storms can be one. Um, that one's actually pretty common uh, with kids. Um, it, the social anxieties start to begin. It's hard to go anywhere. So it's not that they're afraid of places, but when they're feeling just generalized anxiety, it's hard to go anywhere. Wow. They want to stay home or stay where they're safe places, where they're not distressed as yeah. much. I know I don't want to take your more of your time because uh, we're we've got so much to cover still. But my yeah. mind went to this place of I went to a training one time and and there and the guy was talking about. Um, when when people are overly stressed and anxious and he was talking about the these different things that were the best evidence-based practices to, to be able to help quickly relieve things he's talking specifically about when the adrenaline is flowing in the body and how much time it takes to leave and that sort of thing but i still remember when you talk about i'm saying yeah we don't run in and go hug it out um he talked about ideally you want to put them on the top of a large mountain where they can see all around them and know that there is no imminent danger. And it was kind of, we were laughing yeah. about it, yeah. but I like that concept where really you're trying to, they just need to feel like they, nothing is about to come attack them, right? Yeah. So even that rushing in with a big bear hug isn't, I mean, that isn't, yeah, no sudden movements. Yeah, right. It's going to come okay. in nice and easy. Okay. Yeah. And I do, that That brings up an interesting point, too. So uh, a lot of people know in those moments that their cognition, their thoughts, their worries, um, even their reactions to it, they know they're out of proportion. Yeah. They know they're irrational. So trying to rationalize with someone in that moment doesn't work, again, because they're in fight or flight. Um, and, and they don't have the executive functioning of their brain, which helps us to rationalize wow. through situations. And they already know it's excessive. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, tell me I'm overreacting again. That's not helping. Right, I already know right? that part. So right. it's, it's, it's that emotional attunement that just says, hey, I know that you're kind of, you, you, you feels out of control, you feel unsafe. What can we do right now to help you feel safer? Okay. Oh, you want me to answer that? Yeah, exactly. Too? I'm like hanging on the edge of my seat here. Come on. Right? Okay, well, we're going to move into treatment nice. then. And, and okay. it's, it's a great segue. So, um, you know, imagine how out of control our bodies feel when we are at a 10 with anxiety. We've all been there before. Mm. We may not be able to remember it, but we all experience that sometimes. Uh, for people who really have... Uh, anxiety disorders. They're struggling with that all the time. It doesn't mean it's a 10 all the time, but in a pretty regular, everyday sort of way, they're struggling with, with intense anxiety all the time. Wow. 
So um, I, I validate for them how out of control that feels. Um, and and it, then I remind them or start teaching them that, hey, as out of control and overwhelming as those symptoms are in your body, guess what? You can be really powerful and get some of that control back by intervening at the physical level. Okay. So a lot of times, um, therapy can mistakenly focus on trying to change the cognition, the yeah. thoughts, and the worries. Now, that comes in later treatment. See, I love that. I knew you were ahead. That's perfect. Okay, stages. Later. Stages. Okay. Stages. Okay. So, so we start with in the moment, and this is where family members and loved ones can be helpful too. Um, don't coach in a way that's condescending. Don't try to make a person do it. Yeah. But uh, in that loving, reminding sort of way, it starts with the breath. There we go. There are some, we change our nervous system yeah. activity immediately by taking the breath. Mm. Um, now, a lot of people hear that. That's, that's something we throw around all the time. And immediately people want to go into what's next. Right, and I have to tell you, Shelly, so that you know, you know, you're I, holding your breath. By I, the way. I just am. saw you go really like am. this. But it, but I know I've, I'm so, I've been doing this the Headspace app for four years now, and yeah. I feel still when I start to go down this path, I worry that people are like you know flipping the dial, you know, yeah. um, and I feel like okay, oh here he goes, he's gonna pull yeah. out a mat and strap a little ponytail on his head and put a robe on, and, <laughs> but it's it is so important, and there's even correct ways to breathe. True? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that's something that you we could spend oh, wait, by the a way, lot wait, of time wait, on. Do you know why I was holding my breath? Why? I just realized that the camera might be catching my tummy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I was it sucking in a it in. Bit there, yeah, buddy. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. I got up and ran at three AM. Three fifteen? Yeah, three fifteen. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the breath how how do we do it? Okay. So um we could spend a whole lot of time on lots of different ways to do that and to progressively uh, improve that and master that. But I want to keep it simple just as a starting point. Okay. In other so, words, you want to come on for a part two. Uh, no, I don't want to do a whole segment on breathing. <laughs> okay. I will, okay. Bye. All right. <laughs> because that might be really boring for people. <laughs> but um, but I want to keep it simple so it's something that anybody Absolutely. can apply. Yeah. Uh, okay. So really what we're trying to do is elongate the breath. Are you sitting up straight? I am. Are I you am literally. Do yeah. a little bit right now? I, I'm Practice. always game. I did okay. a little headspace this morning. All right. All right. I'm game too. <clears throat> okay. So what we want to do now, imagine your heart rate's beating really fast. So here's actually what we tend to do is we actually hold our breath yeah. and we take really shallow breaths, which kind of seems funny. You would think that we're taking more uh, frequent breaths, um, and some people do. Some people can almost start to hyperventilate. That's where I was going with that, and yes. And, and yep. so, you know, different responses. Um, I know for me, I tend to hold my breath. Okay. Um, and uh, so what we want to do is, is you want to take, it, it can't be too slow at first, so we're just going to try to take a deep breath in. It doesn't have to be long yeah. yet. We're going to work up to that. So let's just do like two, a two count breath. Now are you, uh, so I'm, and I'm a, the Headspace app really makes a big deal about in through the nose, yep. out through the mouth? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Let's do that. We're going to do that a little bit. Sometimes when we blow out too much through the mouth, we can get lightheaded. Yeah. So we're not going to do that every time, but we'll do a couple that way, okay? Right. So ready? Two go. count in. Here we hey, go. Wait, wait, right I want people in. that are listening. I want them to do it right now. I'm yep, sorry. Do it with us you right are. now. You okay? Here we go. In okay. through the nose, out through the mouth. We're going to do two counts in and two counts out. Okay. So here we go. One, two, and out the mouth. Two. One. Two. One more time. One, two, out two. One, two. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot that actually happens in that simplicity. Um, what I find people do too quickly is they take their deep breath and then they're right back to where okay. they were. Okay. I love that you say that because I have people that will say, no, the breathing can make it worse. Yeah. And then I want to say, oh, but it, no. no, okay. So, loved mm -hmm. ones, here's what you can do. You sit with them and do it with them for two minutes. Love it. Two minutes of that will be transformational. Okay. Is that a word? Yeah, it is now. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, so stick with it. So, we, we've got to do it long enough for it to actually, you know, bring the body out of fight or flight or down a couple notches from that state. So um, we're trying to elongate. So you can take that one and two and you can extend it all the way and maybe you get up to five or six, mm -hmm. right? It's creating, you have to, you have to create enough safety um, to be able to do that. So breathing is huge. I'm going to go back to more of a clinical setting for treatment. Okay. So one of the primary things that we focus Wait, so on Wait, so are we moving is, off from breathing? 
Can I just no, go, okay. I'm going I'm to sort of summarize that into oh, a couple, get, okay. couple getters. So, so coming back to a clinical setting, what we really do is we're teaching people how to regulate the body okay. in those moments. And again, this is information that, that is good for all of us to yes. have. We can all use this, right? But the, the breath is pivotal. We have nothing else if we don't start with the breath and come back to the breath. Um, from there, we're trying to relax the body, and again, uh, being able to manipulate that from the outside is powerful. So um, I coach kids and adults to do this next, and that is simply putting your hand on your own neck oh. or your own shoulder. Oh, yeah, I see you, you do, do that little, before. Little shoulder massages here. Do you see me do that? I really do. I really have. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, Shelly has a bad neck. <laughs> I really do. I think it's all of you that. Now you're going to be like, Shelly has anxiety. We're right. stressing her out. Yeah, we're we freaking her out about exactly. and, uh, She needs a little, uh, yeah. So that simple act, again, affects the nervous system. I like it. Um, and can, as soon as you, like, pull your hand away. Can you feel it? Just like your shoulders. Oh, yes. Like, you they know, immediately yes. kind of, like, go down a little bit, right? If <laughs> It's working. Well, what I'm, and, I'm, and I know I'm chomping at the bit, and this is, I want, I, you, you were given so much good advice here, but I just want to, I continually want to do the plug for, it. you have to practice mindfulness. You have to practice the breathing. Yep. Um, there's great right. evidence that says, you know, eight weeks of at least eight minutes a day changes the neural pathways of the brain. Absolutely. I mean, having done this for years, if I, when we just did those little breaths where we turned to, I feel like my body already says, oh, we're doing this? All right, we're kind of calming down. Yeah. And you're talking about right now what you know is often referred to as also a body scan, right? You yeah. kind of check in with every bit of your body, and yeah. you, and at first that feels really silly. I used to not be good at feeling different areas of my body, and now yeah. I feel like, man, I can roll this body scan on down. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry to. So no, out. no, that's great. That's that's great awareness, and that's part of what we do is helping them check in uh, with their bodies. Now, uh, being able to speak to the anxiety, rate it, and intervene at the physical level is crucial. But the larger picture for everyone and people with chronic anxiety is uh, in an everyday sort of way. We have to be reducing our stress, mm. and we think so much that's about our circumstances and changing life and getting life to be all organized and lined up and you know n no uh, chaos and, and no stresses good luck with that yeah right okay. good yeah. luck that's, i mean that's certainly me some there's stress. some things that we can do to simplify things and make life less stressful and one of the things I tell people is, is like, you know, you gotta make tough choices. You gotta choose not to be involved in so much. You gotta be mindful of what you're choosing to do in your life. So okay. That's part of it. Um, but, but coming back to um, that piece of just, uh, uh, we have to work to uh, reduce the overall levels of stress that are in our bodies that are just there every day. Okay. So we are talking about going to the gym. Mm -hmm. Now that's one thing, literally going to the gym, but this practice you're talking about, this is a practice of getting yeah. better and better and better. I don't think people understand that. I, I have so this either. kind of thing I throw out where when I preach mindfulness, I, I and this is anecdotal, but I feel like about 25% uh, just whatever, I'm not listening to you, old man, yeah. you know, and yeah. and then 25% embrace it like no one's business and then and then let me know that, oh my gosh, it literally has changed my life yeah. and, and fairly quick, right? Yeah. And I feel like there's this 50% where they're like, oh, that makes sense, I'll do it every now and again, and sometimes it works, sometimes it's not, and that's the part I want to say, oh, come on, you just keep doing it. It has to yeah. be a practice. Do you think it's true that uh, one of the best ways we can improve our quality of life and our relationships is to practice uh, doing these things, like whether it's literally going to the gym, right, getting your workout and doing these things that help reduce uh, stress in our systems yeah. and, and help us take care of ourselves. Oh, they're so cool. So this goes into, I mean, I, I, my, I, mean, these, I have podcasts on these about the, my emotional baseline theory. You got to do the self-care to raise your baseline to feel like yeah. you can put yourself in a better place. You know, the, the way we create habits, we, we're literally creating new neural pathways in the brain, filing these away in the habit center. If you're not doing the reps or not going to the gym or practicing the breathing, it's not ever gonna just feel yeah. like this is who you are. And when yeah. people get to that point where it is a habit, um, it again, like you've been saying, it's life changing. It is. Yeah. It is, and it's effort. I think I shared this in a meeting the other day, but uh, when I went and did my morning yoga class, and then I came in in the afternoon, and I probably saw about five clients. Um, it it just I just felt different. Mm -hmm. I was so much more present. Um, I wasn't distracted by my own stress in my body. I had energy that mm -hmm. I would not have had, um, and I just I just felt a difference in my connection in my sessions. Yeah. So if I apply that to the outside world and my family and my relationships, 
um, it, it, it's it's powerful. And we all know we need to be doing some of this, but you're right. We just have yeah, to practice have doing to. it. Yeah, we have to. So now you got me, you know, my, my daily running, my daily mindfulness. I mean, I just, they have to happen. But I, happen. I think what people don't even believe is that over time it really does become it is so, it's so important and necessary. And I mean, I, I love to set out, I literally I set my running clothes out every night. I'm giddy. If I, I, if I wake up before my alarm goes off, I'm extra excited, you know? Yeah. I'm not trying to say, oh, well, but we, yeah. it can become that. It can because become you, the, Because yeah. you feel yeah. the effects of it. And yeah. that's what would be really fun is to start some way where people can, uh, maybe even listeners can, can just pipe in and share yeah. what they did. I went for a run today and oh my gosh, met my partner for lunch today and I just felt the difference. Oh, my I love quality that. of connection and my presence and my ability to be available just yeah. is transforming. Um, head over to my Facebook, Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist page and maybe I will start a little thing on that. I would love that to would see cool. that, right? Yeah. Um, I am afraid cool. that you are locked into a part two, my friend. Oh, I, I have so many ideas for other things that I want to talk about. Okay, about yeah. anxiety or about other stuff? Other stuff. Oh, yeah, you're locked in. You're two doors down, All right? right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you make that sound uh, more accessible than it is. I know, true. <laughs> um, but and I hope this is okay. If we do, I really feel like the you you really did a nice job of kind of laying out. I love the concept of stages. I love the concept of like your your what was it your executive functioning. The you know is not in a place to make you know uh, rational reasonable choices in the moment when one is in fight or flight yeah. um, as family members we have to double or triple down in empathy and it's not a 10 minute exercise when the waters are calm maybe that's when we kind of start working on the plan more yeah we don't go in and rush in with a big giant bear hug yeah. but touch is good yeah and in the breathing part i mean i, I don't know you that, that's that's key yeah were you going to start working in it? Like, is another part of that? Because you mentioned yoga, and you're huge yeah. on yoga, and you're I starting to do some. Podcast. Well, you're starting to do some really cool stuff with. I yeah. mean, we're gonna do some cool stuff here yeah. at our place it's with. Exciting. You're getting yeah. really, like changing your flooring. I know my flooring's getting ripped out. I'm getting hardwood floors, and I'm stoked. And I'm. Do you want to kind of tell uh, what is that gonna be about, and then we'll yeah. kind of wrap it up? Yeah. Right? So, so you know what the 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 the, the uh, basis of that in a nutshell is bringing yoga practices uh, in the office, mm -hmm. right? Because you and I can sit here like we just did, promoting all the things that we can do for our physical health that translate to our emotional and, and mental health and wellness. Um, but we're putting that into action. You know? And we're saying there is so much evidence showing that that's... Because yeah. I honestly, in the fact you just said that, gave me anxiety because I believe in this breathing stuff so much, but I, I still feel very vulnerable to have a client do it in session because yeah. I feel like, man, they're paying me and, yeah. and, are, and are they in their mind thinking, I'm not paying this guy to like sit here and breathe, yeah. you know? Yeah. But yet it's like if they're not doing it. Yeah. So, so powerful for us to do that at the beginning of our sessions, do a check-in in the middle, bring it back to the breath, and then do it at the end, uh -huh. right? Because we literally are, anything else you're going to say in that session may not even go in until that person's level yeah, of uh, stress yeah, comes right. down a little bit, right? Yeah, you're right. But yeah, so we are excited. Um, uh, my room's getting turned into a, a, yoga, a yoga studio. studio. Now, this is not yoga like at the gym. Okay. This is going to primarily focus um, on, it, it's always gonna come back to our prana, which is our breath. Okay. Um, and it's going to come back to mindfulness. It's gonna be teaching people how to connect to the signals in their body, how to do that body scan, how to yeah. and then how to regulate it, how to move that stress and tension out of our bodies. Mm. Um, we're particularly going to be, be focusing in on helping people who have been through trauma. Okay. Now you add trauma to a body, uh, which is a different kind of anxiety and on a whole different level, uh, and that is uh, trans. That prohibits, in some ways, people's ability to do uh, therapy in the room. Mm -hmm. So, how much more powerful can we be when we're helping move some of that trauma and that chronic state of fight or flight that they're in through uh, uh, some yoga therapy? Okay. Is what we call it. And you're gonna. And you already told us we have to do it, right? You're oh, gonna, you're going to be my guinea pigs, yeah. 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 yeah, and it's new for me, you know, and, and I'm super excited about it uh, because it's just going to be more experiential. It's, it's bringing uh, into the office all the things that we're trying to do as just individuals to walk our talk and yeah. be healthy people, um, and now I get to do it with people, you know, in the office. So I love being yoga, in the chair, but now I get pants? to be on the mat. Okay, am I wearing yoga pants? Uh, we're going to, with men in yoga pants, it's a very delicate... <laughs> Um, you know, so, so we're going to talk about that 
okay. off air, okay. but it's an important question. Yeah. Don't I'd, do anything until we've processed it first. I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> Shelly Aldrich, this was like better than I had anticipated. <laughs> that sounds like, like you know, I wasn't expecting much. So you much. were, yeah, yeah, that is exactly <laughs> no, what that No, this was great. Like. No, you, you, uh, gave well, me, you gave me a you. lot of tools that I know I'm going to be able to implement right away and uh, in my therapy and in with people in my life. And so, um, if you're okay, we'll have you on, and maybe we can go into some of the more kind Absolutely. of things we prepared. Just build and, on that. Okay, and then you will be back for all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I want to talk about the, you know, therapy with kids. I want to talk about, I mean, just all kinds of stuff, right? So, a couple of shout outs yeah. that I want to do. Yeah. So, I want us to bring in the uh, gambling addiction panel. Oh. We have three of us here. Uh, I haven't even thought about that. Super want to do that. Um, I bet I that also, would be good. So I also there? want to take a personal turn. Okay. I'm willing to come on. Uh, maybe with my non-therapist hat on, okay, uh, and uh, be a voice and an advocate for uh, family members who are affected by our opioid oh. crisis. Okay, well, if you're interested. Yeah, of course. I'm <laughs> okay, all right. Um, a couple. Where can people find you, Shelley? BridgesCounselingCenter.com. Yep, Shelley. Okay. S H E L L Y. That's right, and uh, this will. Uh, we will have you back. I'm so All grateful. Right. Awesome. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks There's the so virtual much. couch, but thank you for being here in the chair. Yeah. Until awesome. next time. All right. Thanks, Shelly. Or